So, um, hello everyone, um, welcome. Um, I'm Dr. Kate Clayton Hathaway. I'm a long standing human rights activist and a member of Oxford City Local Group. I'm delighted to be chairing tonight's event and welcoming uh, both those who are familiar with Amnesty International and those engaging for the first time. Amnesty International is a movement of some 10 million ordinary people around the globe, standing up for humanity and human rights. Amnesty was founded in 1961, so we're celebrating our 60th birthday this year. Tonight, we have the honour of three speakers on global trade and human rights issues. First of all, though, I'd like to just take a couple of minutes to tell you about the Amnesty International UK Central England Festival of Social Justice. The festival brings together 40 local amnesty groups in the Central England region, um, other amnesty networks and channels, and a range of community organisations to spread the word about social justice and human rights and to engage as big and diverse a group of people as possible in campaigning actions. Some housekeeping points before we, we get started with our speakers. Um, the webinar software being used for this meeting, GoToWebinar, um, has some important differences compared to the kind of online meeting platforms you may have used before, such as Zoom. It's more of a broadcast experience and designed for large number of numbers of attendees. As an attendee, you are neither visible nor audible. You can submit use questions using the questions option in your control panel. So please, can you only use this for questions? And these can be submitted at any time during the webinar. Uh, note that there isn't any general chat facility between attendees. I'll do my best to respond to as many questions as possible in the time that we have, and um, our speakers are each going to make a presentation, then we'll have time for a Q&A at the end. In all of your questions, can you please be respectful of others? The webinar will be recorded, and all of our attendees will receive a follow-up email containing a link to that recording. If you have any technical difficulties, please try closing the webinar and rejoining. And finally, can you please be aware that opinions expressed during this webinar uh, may not necessarily be those of Amnesty International. So before we kick off, we're just going to run a couple of brief polls and find out a little bit more about our audience. If everybody can vote on uh, uh, this quick poll, that would be really handy. And hopefully we should have some results popping up. Fantastic. So about half of you from the Oxford area, plenty in central England um, and in the Midlands and um, others from the UK. But uh, I just need to move my little menu. Sadly, no one outside of the UK, but hopefully when we have this recording, we can send it around. We'll have some uh, uh, some other attendees. So um, we have a second poll just about to come up to And again, if you can respond to that one, it'd be really helpful for us to understand a little bit about um, how people come to us. Oh, lovely to see plenty of local amnesty group people here um, and the social media that we've done. We've done quite a lot of social media work. So great that uh, that's that's working and that our um, amnesty mailings are working, too. So thank you for responding to those. That's very helpful for us to get an idea about uh, who our audience are and, and uh, how they come to us. So now I'm delighted to introduce our speakers. Um, our first speaker is Nabila Khan. Hi, Nabila. Um, Nabila works for 
Hiya. Um, Nabila works for Ethical Consumer magazine and is currently campaigning for the tech giants to pay a 10% digital services tax to cover a 3% pay rise for all NHS staff. In 2020, she completed an MA in International Political Economy at the University of Manchester. And since last October, she's been working for Amnesty International as the China and Taiwan Country Coordinator. Over to you, Nabila. Hello, everyone, um, and thank you very much for introducing me, Kate. Um, so I'm going to be speaking about the uh, One Belt, One Road initiative, or the, the Belt and Road, and I'll be referring to it as the BRI, just for convenience and the impact it's having in um, Xinjiang, uh, particularly with the Uyghurs. Um, and I'm sure a lot of you um, know about this issue because it's had a lot of recent media coverage. So what exactly is the One Belt, One Road initiative? The BRI is China's proposal for enhanced trade links by both land and sea, and is the signature foreign policy initiative of Xi Jinping, who is the premier of China and is the man on the right. And in, according to the Chinese sources, it aims at achieving a win-win outcome by promoting connectivity between Asia, Europe and Africa and their adjacent seas by forging partnerships between the countries along these two routes. The BRI stands to be the project of the century. The countries it plans to include compromise 55% of world gross national product, 70% of the world's population and 75% of known energy reserves. Already, China has pledged to spend $1 trillion building new roads, railways and ports far beyond its borders and adjusted for inflation is seven times the amount spent by the US on the Marshall Plan to rebuild Europe after World War II. There are two routes along the BRI. One is the Overland Belt, One Belt, which goes across Eurasia, and the other is a maritime road, the One Road, that grows across the Indian Ocean and up to Europe via the Suez Canal. On land, the belt will be focused on building economic corridors along existing international transport routes, key population centers, and major industrial parks. At sea, the road will focus on opening up fast, secure, and efficient shipping routes connecting major seaports. Already, the project has the participation of 130 countries, not only China's neighbors, but also encompassing nations in Africa and Latin America. Thus, this project is not only focused on nation states through with project though with, with projects going into the Arctic, outer space, and cyberspace. So if you I just want to show you um, a map of China. So if you can see here, here is Beijing and Xinjiang is right to the on the western borders of China. It's an absolutely huge area. And the reason I'm showing you this is because um, basically Xinjiang has tremendous geopolitical importance with regards to the One Belt, One Road initiative. So if you can see here, um, this is the One Belt. So this is the overland path that goes through Eurasia. Um, and you can see it's going through China, through the West, through Pakistan, uh, in the Middle East, up to Moscow and down to Europe. And you've got the one road, which is the maritime route, and that's going through the Straits of Malacca here, uh, going through the Indian Ocean, through uh, the Suez Canal, and up to Europe again. Um, so it's it's a massive project. Um, and you can see, you know, that there's been a lot of uh, train routes that have been constructed already. Quite a bit of trade uh, goes up through uh, the One Belt. So um, there are cargo trains that go through Russia. Um, all the way through Russia to Europe, um, even uh, up here they go, they go through Urumqi, um, and I believe um, quite a few laptops are transported to Europe this way. Uh, why are China pursuing the BRI? So one of the reasons why China is pursuing the BRI is because it's, it's state-owned companies have an excess capacity, so they're producing too much and it's not enough for the Chinese domestic market. So um, they're basically trying to develop the hinterland regions of China and the inland regions because most of the development is concentrated towards the eastern coast of China. Um, also, uh, Eurasia is in need of development. Um, it needs uh, over a trillion dollars worth of infrastructure in investment over the next 10 years just to develop. And China sees this as a good way, not only to 
um, increase its influence, but also to ensure that its excess capacity is consumed and it can continue to grow. Because if you look at the chart here, in the early 2000s, um, it was recording double digit growth figures. So, you know, at 2006, it had 15% growth. And then after the financial crisis, it kind of dipped and it went to a really, really big low point during Corona. And now it's bounced up to about 6.5%, which in the West, we consider that to be quite a good number. But for China, it's, it's not, you know, they want those really double digit growth figures um, because it's just so big. Kazakhstan, the buckle in China's belt. Bordering along China's far western region, which is Xinjiang, Kazakhstan has rich natural resources, favorable geography, and is best positioned amongst the Central Asian nations to become a hub in the BRI. It stands at an important crossroads in Eurasia between China to the east, Russia to the north, and the entire European continent to the west, and is an incredibly important road and rail link between East Asia, Russia, and Europe. Kazakhstan's economy is equal to Hong Kong's and is the biggest in Central Asia. It is a major oil and gas producer with the capacity to extract and export more and is estimated to have the fifth largest oil reserves in the world. You see here, uh, Kazakhstan is, you can't see in the map, but to the right or to its eastern border is Xinjiang. Um, and it, it's quite geopolitically important. When you look at the map here, Kazakhstan literally does, it's a bit like Turkey, it literally tra traverses both Europe and Asia. Um, so for China to get to Europe, it needs to go through Xinjiang, through Kazakhstan, and then it can get to Europe. Kazakhstan and the Uyghurs. Kazakhstan borders China's Xinjiang region and is home to the largest Uyghur diaspora outside of China, with an estimated 200,000 Uyghurs residing there. Ethnic Kazakhs are the largest group after Uyghurs to be subjected to the internment policies implemented by the Chinese state in Xinjiang. And there have been several instances where citizens of Kazakhstan have ended up in mass internment camps when visiting relatives in China. However, over the last 20 years, Kazakhstan has become increasingly dependent on China economically and by extension politically. However, both ethnic Uyghurs and Kazakhs have both traversed at the porous border between Kazakhstan and China, and many have relatives in both countries. In 1991, then President Nursultan Nazarbayev encouraged ethnic diaspora Kazakhs to return to Kazakhstan to encourage an ethnic majority. Many came from China and still have close ties with Xinjiang, and there are still over 1 million Kazakhs in Xinjiang. It, is this, it has been this Kazakh, Kazakh population from China, which has been very vocal about the rep, rep, repression taking place in the Xinjiang region and its impact on ethnic Kazakhs. This population has established a powerful advocacy organization called Atajurt, which means fatherland, which has kept the repression occurring in Xinjiang in public view. The organization has established international ties with journalists, scholars, and activists, and has created the world's largest database of victims of China's mass internment system in Xinjiang, and remains vocal about the need for Kazakhstan to speak up. In many ways, this group has been at the forefront of maintaining international attention to what has been happening to the local population in Xinjiang. There is also a growing Sinophobia in the country, and several protests against China have occurred. Ethnic Kazakhs, as opposed to Uyghurs, are very powerful in Kazakhstan, and I'm. It, this is just my opinion, but it may be worth using them to leverage the Kazakh government to speak about, speak up about what's happening in Xinjiang and pressure China to allow the UN to conduct a visit, which is one of Amnesty's aims. Um, I think, believe as well, Almaty, which is a major city in Kazakhstan along the BRI, is also twinned with Urumqi, which is a major city in Xinjiang. Um, so it shows you how close the two, uh, China and Kazakhstan, how close they are. And then the maps, you can see Xinjiang, it just borders Kazakhstan. And it's very obvious you've got to get through Xinjiang to get out to Kazakhstan. I don't have time for that. So Pakistan. 
So Pakistan is also another major country al along the BRI. Um, and what's happened is um, there is a China-Pakistan economic corridor that has been created, and that is a collection of infrastructure projects that are under construction throughout Pakistan since 2013. Xi Jinping himself has put his personal stamp on this project, and China has invested heavily in Pakistan. The CPEC is the flagship project of the BRI and will run throughout Pakistan. The focus is on connecting China with the Pakistani port of Gwadar through highway, rail, and pipeline infrastructure. For Pakistan, the aim of CPEC is to leverage Chinese capital, production capacity, and know-how to upgrade Pakistan's infrastructure and build a mechanism for sustainable economic growth. Uh, the reason for this is because Pakistan is besieged with energy problems. When you, if you ever have visited Pakistan, um, you will notice there are constant blackouts. And this is something that um, other development banks have complained about. And they've said, um, you know, it's costing about up to 6% of Pakistan's GDP is being lost to these blackouts. Um, so Pakistan is looking at this Chinese investment as a way to solve that. Um, whether that happens remains to be seen. Um, and here is Guada port, uh, which I mentioned earlier. For China, the aim of CPEC is to facilitate trade along an overland route that connects China to the Indian Ocean, linking the Xinjiang city of Kashgar to the Pakistani port of Guada. This means Beijing would gain a connection to the Arabian Sea, providing an alternate trade route to the Malacca Strait in Southeast Asia. The Malacca Dilemma. Over the years, energy security and particularly oil supply security has become a major concern for the Chinese government because seaborne energy imports are very vulnerable and China lacks the naval power necessary to protect its sea lanes. China fears that during a national security crisis, ships carrying energy resources could be intercepted, meaning a disruption to the free flow of energy into China, derailing its economic growth upon which the legitimacy of the Chinese government is based and stop it from pursuing its greater ambitions. For China, it is better if oil deliveries are made closer to home, which is where Pakistan and the CPEC project come in. It's also seen as a counterweight to India in South Asia and a potential training ground for Uyghur militants from Xinjiang. And the stability of Pakistan, which is a very close ally to China, is a major concern which is why CPEC was deemed a necessary strategic commitment. <clears throat> so this is the Malacca dilemma. So currently you can see um, for oil to come from to China, it's got to go all the way through uh, India, through the Straits of Malacca, up to either Hong Kong, Shanghai or Beijing. Um, now, what China is trying to do is basically, here's Guada port, they want oil to be transferred to transferred by sea to Guada port, and then this pipeline would take it up to Kashgar, which is in China, and then it would go to the rest of China. So, all roads lead to Xinjiang. Xinjiang is home to over 11 million Uyghurs and covers an area of 1.66 million square kilometers, which accounts for one sixth of China's land mass. Its oil, natural gas, and coal reserves make up more than 20% of China's energy reserves, meaning the region can be turned into a national powerhouse. According to Sean Roberts, a professor of international development at George Washington University, the Uyghurs' attachments to their traditional lands and way of life is seen by the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, as a risk to the successful implementation to, of the BRI. The intention to make Xinjiang a central part of the BRI created a new urgency in the CCP to prevent further Uyghur dissent in the region. In many ways, what we are seeing today is an attempt to entirely eliminate any possible Uyghur descent to the transformation of their homeland that the BRI will inevitably facilitate. As part of um, CPEC, one proposal is to transfer oil and gas from Pakistan into China's Xinjiang province. And the route would involve oil tankers taking offloading their cargoes at Guada, which is heavily financed by China. Energy resources would then be transported by road, rail, or pipeline to Islamabad. From there, the energy supply would be sent a further 750 miles to Kashgar in Xinjiang along the Karkaram Highway that links Pakistan with China. If successful, this would mean China would gain an alternative to the Malacca Strait. 
So you can see here, you know, all the proposed pipelines or the existing pipelines, and you just see like the tentacles coming out as part of the, the BRI. So the BRI and human rights. So the BRI is reshaping the current perception of development and political processes around the world. It has a law to millions of people in Asia as it seem, as China is seen to be pushing the United States out of the way. And China is also seen as an underdog to people in Asia and Africa. And the BRI is seen as a blow against their former colonists. The BRI has also shifted the global power balance in China's favor, more towards China's favor. And it's given, given currency to China's argument that for development, you need strong authoritarian system undeterred by expectations of civil liberties and political pluralism. Countries that have aligned themselves with the BRI have also cracked down on human rights, such as Pakistan, the Maldives, and Bangladesh. Some BRI projects have also drawn criticism for facilitating corruption, non-transparent loan agreements, and non-competitive contracts that require the use of Chinese companies. Um, there's also been an expansion of surveillance and repression in Xinjiang because of it. And um, in my opinion, I think a lot of what's happening in Xinjiang now is because of the BRI. Um, it's also currently, it's very difficult to get testimony from formerly interned Uyghurs. So a lot of the testimony that's actually come from the camps haven't been from Uyghurs themselves, they've been from Kazakhs who've been released and then left the country and either gone to Kazakhstan or elsewhere. And the reason for this is because Uyghurs are actually kept under very tight control. So once they've been released from um, a internment camp, they're not issued passports. And so, so far there haven't been any or very few witness statements from camp guards or workers. And since 2017, there's been no telephone communication between exiled Uyghurs and those in China. So this is what you hear a lot in the news about, um, you know, Uyghurs who live abroad can't get in touch with their family are still in China. Can the BRI be used as a tool to leverage China? Ultimately, I believe it can, because the success of BRI rests upon the recipient countries. And I think the two most important countries are Kazakhstan and Pakistan. Um, there's also uh, an aspect of consumer pressure. So there are lots of companies, famous companies, that are, have supply chains that are located in Xinjiang, um, which I will talk, which I will show you in a bit. But it might be worth making a campaign or, you know, coordinating to target certain brands. So if you see here, these are the, you know, the brands that have been implicated in with supply chains in in the Xinjiang region. Um, I don't know what everyone thinks, but I was thinking maybe to pick out a few, two, three, four, and then maybe having a campaign where we can write to them and um, express our disapproval. Not necessarily a, a consumer boycott, but just apply consumer pressure. And the reason why I'm saying this is because of Mulan. So I don't know if you know, but Mulan was actually shot in um, Xinjiang and there was a massive backlash against it. And, you know, it wasn't as successful as it could have been. And I think that really hurt Disney. Um, so that shows you the power of consumer pressure and consumer backlash. Um, and I don't think because of all the backlash that Disney received, I don't think they will be filming again in Xinjiang. Any questions? OK, so if anybody does have any questions, if they can send them in on the um, the, the, the question um, so the, so the submission in their panel, then um, we'll save those to the end. Um, but thank you so much, Nabila. We'll we'll sort of um, we'll, we'll come back to to the points that you made um, once the other speakers have uh, have, have uh, done their bits. But um, thank you very much. So next, um, uh, our next speaker is uh, Peter Bentley. So um, after a 30 year career in the civil service, Peter switched to a new vocation, volunteering for Oxfam. Um, he's a voluntary admin manager in the Stevenage shop and also a volunteer speaker. He particularly likes the speaker work, um, which gives him the chance to talk about the work of Oxfam and the issues that Oxfam cares about, such as um, inequality, climate change and women's rights. He talks in schools, scouting groups, colleges and community groups with the aim of raising awareness and encouraging people to take action to end poverty, po poverty and uh, injustice. So um, I'll hand over to you, Peter. So um, good evening, everybody. Global trade has helped to lift millions of people out of poverty, especially in China 
and South Asia. And it's also helped millions of women to become more independent by being able to earn their own living. But sadly, global trade isn't reaching its potential. And one of the reasons that it isn't reaching its potential is the great inequality of bargaining power between the corporations in the rich world who buy and the farmers and companies in the poorest parts of the world uh, who produce and sell. And we see this, for example, when we hear about the people who uh, produce our clothing. Who Peter, sorry, can I just interrupt you? I can't see your your presentation slides yet. Oh, right, no, I'm, I'm not. I, I'll be, they'll be in a oh, minute. Good, that's all right. Huh? Okay, I apologise for interrupting. Be for another minute. That's it. Um, and um, so we we hear about this inequality, and we hear about. Um, uh, the manufacture of our clothing by people on very low wages in dreadful uh, working conditions. We don't hear as much about the people in the poorest countries of the world who produce our food. And similarly there, we have a lot of people who are on poverty wages, long hours and dreadful uh, working conditions. And to tell you more about that, I shall sh share my screen. This woman is picking tea in Assam, in India. Um, and she'll walk for about an hour to get to the tea garden. She'll start work at eight o'clock in the morning and work through till four o'clock with a short break for lunch. And during that day, she's expected to pick 24 kilograms of tea. If she picks the 24 kilograms, she'll get paid 130 rupees. That's about one pound 30. An example of poverty wages of the people who grow and process our food. Another problem is uh, working conditions. This is uh, Carlo, who works on a fruit farm in Brazil. And we can see his skin here, very badly damaged by pesticides used on the fruit farm where he works. Just an example of the very poor working conditions that some of the people have who grow uh, our food. We can help a little bit by buying fair trade. And if I buy tea, coffee, bananas or chocolate, unless it's got that fair trade label on, I won't buy it. But lots of food doesn't have a fair trade label. It's not available. These people are dressed up as fruit and you might be wondering why they're dressed up as fruit. They're going to the UK headquarters of Lidl in Wimbledon because at the time this photograph was taken in 2019, Lidl was the worst of the big four UK supermarkets in terms of its policies and processes for supporting the human rights of the people who grow and process the food that the supermarkets sell. And over the last few years, Oxfam has been looking in huge detail at the human rights of the people who grow the food and process the food that's sold by the six biggest supermarkets. And it's looked and summarised in four uh, main areas. Transparency and accountability. And uh, one example of what Oxfam has looked for here has been whether the supermarket has um, signed up to uphold the United Nations guiding principles on business and human rights. Because these principles require that businesses have in place policies and processes through which they can both know and show that they respect human rights. The next two areas are really about workers and small scale farmers. These are the um, 
small holders, family farms, workers includes people who process the food and workers who actually work as employees uh, on farms. And an example of one of the things that Oxfam has looked for here is whether the supermarkets have policies to say that when they negotiate with a supplier, they'll want to make sure that they're not negotiating so hard that that supplier can't pay a living wage to the employees. And the last big area of focus is on women in the supply chain. Because around the world, women face massive discrimination. They're paid a lot less than men. They tend to be paid informally, so they don't have a contract of employment. If the country has a minimum wage, they won't be um, come under the banner of that uh, minimum wage. No sick pay and no pension. And women are much more likely to be subject to harassment and particularly to um, sexual harassment. So there's a special focus on the treatment of women. What is each of those supermarkets doing to make sure that women in their supply chain are protected? And when we bring the scores together, we get an average score for each of the six supermarkets. And what we can see is some are a lot better than others, but none even reach 50%. So although Tesco is at the top, there's still a long way to go. The good news is that since Oxfam started this work, all the supermarkets have improved their policies and processes for protecting the human rights of the people who grow and process the food. So at the bottom, in 2018, uh, Aldi was absolutely uh, abysmal at 1%. It's still at the bottom of the league table, but it's now at 25%. So it's doing, it's doing more, nothing like enough doing more. Tesco in 2018 was at the top of the table. It's doubled its score. It's doing more than what it did in uh, 2018. And Oxfam works in two ways on this. One is an insider approach in which um, staff from Oxfam go out and talk to each of the supermarkets about what they can do to help the human rights of the people in their supply chain. So sharing information, sharing tips on um, the processes to put in, in place to help them to improve. At the same time, Oxfam has been encouraging shoppers at each of those supermarkets to say to the supermarket, you're not doing enough on this, you should be doing more. And it's that combination of the insider and the outsider approach that's made the difference. And um, it isn't till uh, later this year that we'll see the results for 2021, but I'll be very interested to see uh, to what extent there's been further improvement. Now we don't all have to dress up as fruit to uh, get the improvement. Um, if you want to help, if you uh, search for behind the barcodes, you should come up with this um, page. You can then click on your supermarket. That will give you uh, an email template and you can either follow the words on the template, tweak them or write something completely different. The main thing is that by sending that email to your supermarket, you're saying that there's yet another customer who cares about the people who grow the food or process the food that you buy from that supermarket. And Oxfam isn't looking for people to switch supermarkets, simply to say to your supermarket, we want you to do more to help the human rights of those people in your supply chain. And I think a modern supermarket is a miracle. The range of food, the quality of food, is beyond anything that the kings of olden days could ever dream of. But we should never forget who grew that food, who packaged it, who processed it, who shipped it. And we should care about them enough to want them to have 
to the benefit of global trade through having a living wage, through having safe working conditions. And I think it's down to all of us to put that pressure on the supermarkets to make sure that they have that living wage and the fair working conditions that they all, all deserve. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. That's absolutely great. Um, can I just remind our um, uh, everybody who's who's watching, um, who's in the audience, that um, uh, we, we'd like you to send questions in if you can. And in the panel that's a, a drop down, um, uh, there is sorry, there is a drop down there for you to put questions in, and we'll ask questions of all of the panelists at the end. That would be really helpful. Thank you. So finally, over to our our last but not least speaker, Nada Awad. So Nada holds a master's degree in international relations and international security from Sciences Pro Paris. She works on uh, human rights violations in the Arab region as the international advocacy officer at the Cairo Institute for Human Rights Studies. Um, she's also a policy member at the Palestinian think tank Al Shabaka. So over to you, Nada. Thank you very much. Um, I will be addressing the issue of the UN database and before that putting the, some context around uh, the issue of um, how businesses are contributing to and benefiting from gross human rights violations in the occupied Palestinian territory. So in the context of Israel's settler colonialism in the occupied Palestinian territory, which began when we're talking about the West Bank and Gaza in 1967, businesses have played a significant role in sustaining Israel's illegal settlement enterprise. And they are at great risk when working and when uh, involved in the Israeli settlements uh, of contributing to or benefiting from Israeli human rights violations committed against the Palestinian people. In the OPT, as in other cases of ongoing foreign occupation, the absence of accountability has enabled occupying states to engage in activity in occupied territory with near impunity, while leaving many private actors, such as businesses, to contribute to and benefit from gross human rights violations. This affects detrimentally the lives of millions of Palestinian, Palestinians, depriving them of their basic rights, including the right to self-determination and sovereignty over national resources. Israel's illegal settlement enterprise systematically denies Palestinians their access to their land and natural wealth and resources through its discriminatory zoning and planning regimes, which is put in place by Israel in the laws, practices and policies for the benefit of the Israeli settler population, forcibly transferring Palestinians and creating a coercive environment which results in the unlawful removal of the indigenous Palestinian population, including through house demolitions. And we have to remind that population transfer may amount to a crime against humanity when practiced in a widespread or systematic manner. While the world today is facing the devastating impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, Israel is escalating its illegal demolition of Palestinian homes and properties. The Israeli policy of house demolition, for example, is part of Israel's settler colonial regime and it is institutionalized to forcibly transfer the Palestinian people and to expand Israeli illegal settlements in the OPT, in violations, of course, of the international law. The demolition of Palestinian houses in the occupied Palestinian territory are made possible through the use by Israel of equipment provided by companies such as, I'm just citing examples, GCP, Caterpillar, Hyundai, which assist Israel's settlement expansion. Moreover, the Israeli uh, and multinational companies, such as one example, the Basque Cap, have evidently been involved in the Israeli expansion of illegal settlements through building of housing units and associated infrastructure, including transportation. So the Israeli settlements, which directly violate international law, amount to a war crime under the Fourth Geneva Convention, which states that the occupying power shall not deport or transfer parts of its own population into the territory it occupies. As mentioned by uh, the previous speaker, there are UN guiding principles on businesses and human rights, and they explicitly provide for companies' responsibility to respect standards of international humanitarian law. 
But these principles do not have teeth and they cannot hold corporations to account for involvement in human rights abuses. Meanwhile, there is at the United Nations a binding instrument which is currently being discussed and formulated by UN member states. And this is a binding uh, instrument in relation to business activities uh, and specifically on transnational character and human rights stand, like uh, business activities of a transnational character and human rights standards, which is trying to uh, indicate this commitment of the international community to end corporate involvement in human rights abuses and their profiting from grave breaches of international law. However, this is an open-ended discussion between states and a binding instrument will not be functional anytime soon. So in this context, I will discuss the example of the United Nations database as an important tool to advance corporate accountability. Following decades of Israeli illegal expansion of settlements, the United Nations Human Rights Council established in 2012 an international fact-finding mission which investigated the implications of the Israeli settlements on the civil, political, economic, social, and cultural rights of the Palestinian people in the OPT, including East Jerusalem. Amongst the interesting findings of these, this fact-finding mission was uh, the, in, this, in their report, was um, the finding around businesses. And the report said that business enterprises have directly and indirectly enabled, facilitated, and profited from the construction and growth of the settlements, including through, I will mention a few examples, the report cites, the supply of equipment and material facilitating the construction and expansion of settlements, the supply of surveillance and identification equipment for settlements, the supply of equipment for the demolition of housing and property, which we already uh, mentioned, the supply of security services, equipment and materials to enterprises operating in settlements, as well as the provision of services and utilities to support the maintenance and existence of settlements, including transport, which we also mentioned with CAF. Uh, and finally, and the last example I will mention from this report is the banking and financial operations which help to develop, expand, and maintain settlements and their activities, including loans for housing and the development of businesses. Based on these findings, these important findings of this mission, the Human Rights Council mandated in 2016 the United Nations Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, the OHCHR, to produce a database of business enterprises involved in activities detailed in the report of the fact-finding mission. So what is this UN database and why is it an important tool to advance corporate accountability? The initial report of the UN database of businesses involved in Israel's illegal settlement was published in the form of a report containing 112 Israeli and international companies and it was published in March 2020. Amongst the international companies listed in the UN database were companies from the United Kingdom, the United States, France, the Netherlands, Thailand, and Luxembourg. Working in the fields, different fields, but I will mention some, the field of tourism, for example, TripAdvisor, Airbnb, Booking.com, and the British company Opodo. In the field of transportation, for example, Edges from France, and in the field of construction was listed the British company GC Bamford Excavators, later this. This UN database was published more than three years after it was mandated to be published due to political pressure being exerted on the United Nations by Israel and its allies not to publish the database of companies. While the report does not include all companies involved in Israel's settlement enterprise, it is an important step in addressing the economic incentive structure which allows to perpetuate Israeli occupation. And while the database mandate does not call for the implementation of measures against companies for their involvement in Israel's illegal enterprise, it is an important tool which serves first, uh, firstly and most importantly as a platform for transparency. This means the listing of companies which are directly and indirectly enabling and facilitating and profiting from the construction and growth of Israeli illegal settlements are put in a UN report that is public to the world for the world to see. 
This innovative tool positively incentivizes corporations to end their activities and relationship with Israel's illegal settlement enterprise. And it creates a deterrence against businesses getting involved in human rights abuses, grave breaches of international humanitarian law and internationally recognized crimes, including like in this case in the OPT. In this context, the database is a tangible tool that can be used in other situations of conflict and occupation. And this is an example that can be repeated in other scenarios. But in order for this UN database to be a living document, a living tool of transparency and deterrence against corporate involvement in human rights abuses, the Human Rights Council mandated the UN Office of the High Commissioner to annually update the UN database, allowing for businesses which are no longer involved in the said settlement activities to be removed, and for businesses which decided to get involved to be added to the list of companies. As the initial database report was issued in March 2020, the updated report of the UN database should have been published in March 2021. However, the UN Office of the High Commissioner declared in March that there were, no, but there were budgetary constraints and resource challenges associated with completing the annual update of the UN database. While civil society from across the world and UN member states have continuously called on the OHCHR to fulfill its mandate and produce an annual update of the UN database, today the mandate is at risk. If the UN Human Rights Council succumbs to political pressure regarding this mandate, it would likely be a first. Such a failure would imply that human rights are politicized and financialized and that state actors and corporate interests overrid human rights. And this decision whether to fulfill the database is an important test for the UN's universal implementation and enforcement of the international legal framework, as well as the test for the credibility of the UN Human Rights Council and its mechanism. So based on this uh, innovative tool that could be implemented in other cases of human rights uh, violations in the context of occupation or conflict, um, we call on the specific case of the Palestine, uh, on civil society in the UK to support the database and to support accountability, uh, corporate accountability in Palestine, by reaching out to companies listed in the database within their jurisdiction. Um, so listed within the database from the UK to remind them of their responsibilities under international law and urge them to terminate any business activities or relationship that may be in breach of international law. But also we call on civil society uh, to urge the United Kingdom to take the necessary measures to ensure that business enterprises within their territory respect international law and other relevant laws throughout their operations and um, yeah, business operations in the OPT. Yeah, thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Nada. Um, we have a number of questions coming through now, so if the panel are quite happy to um, to answer some of those, we, we, have, a, we have a little bit of time to, to do some Q&A. Um, first of all, I'll start off with um, uh, some for, there are a couple of questions for Peter um, that we have. Uh, first of all, um, a couple of questions, Peter. Um, firstly, um, is your Oxfam system like the fair trade system um, in the, 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 the system that you described um, for, um, if you like, ranking um, retailers for um, uh, their, their, their human rights um, uh, considerations? Uh, no, I think there are. Uh, different ends of the supply chain um, because uh, what Oxfam has done is to look at the policies and processes that are set out by um, the supermarkets and the thing there is that the culture of an organisation starts from the top so by getting engagement of the top management and setting the scene then that um, influences the buyers, which in turn um, helps the suppliers and, and, and so on. So that's very much a, a, a top end approach. Whereas um, with fair trade, um, the farm or farmer or processor 
uh, that wants fair trade certification has to uh, live up to those uh, standards so that for example with uh, fair trade um, as well as having a guaranteed price and a premium a social premium extra money for the uh, local community um, that farm or wherever it's been certified um, has to live up to certain environmental standards which are then audited so that the um, the, the nuts and bolts of uh, fair trade is very much at the farm level or the processing level whereas the uh, Oxfam approach in this particular case is very much at the top end of what's going on in the corporate offices of the um, headquarters. Oxfam does other work on food supply chains, uh, for example, some work recently with Marks and Spencers to, to um, go in um, almost underground um, to look at what uh, is happening with some of the suppliers uh, to Marks and Spencers beyond an, an, an audit. But in this particular case I've spoken about, it's very much about the culture in the, um, in the head offices of the supermarkets themselves. Fantastic. Um, what I what I really appreciate and liked about all of your different talks was was how um, you were basically showing us all of the different parts of the supply chain, all of the different actors that can have an impact on something about this, right from the UN down to the the, the consumer buying a bar of chocolate. So um, there is uh, there is a story in there that there that there. Our possibilities for us as campaigners, as human rights campaigners, to bring about some change. Um, just another question um, uh, for you, Peter, and then um, I shall uh, move on. Um, uh, would there be um, any additional sort of pro products or foods that you think we should try for in terms of um, uh, trying to obtain fair trade status? Is that anything that that, that might be? Uh, um, kind of on the cards, if you like, from or a good idea from the point of view of, of Oxfam's campaigning. Um, I mean, that would be for the Fair Trade Foundation to uh, consider. Um, so that what is sad is that, um, that there are systems for giving a fair trade certificate to things like uh, avocados and um, other. Uh, fruit um, but it just hasn't got rolled out in the way that it has for for example with uh, something like um, bananas and uh, again um, there isn't a, a campaign at the moment so it's less likely to be pr productive but um, if I walk into a supermarket and I do sell an avocado that's got fair trade on then I'll buy it even if it might cost a lot more because it's giving that signal to the supermarket and a classic case is cashew nuts um, I, I like uh, uh, cashew nuts and the, you know, to buy them in a sort of reasonable volume there's no fair trade certificate but every now and again I'll get the little package which has got that fair trade certificate on it's meant, it meant as a lunch snack just as a it's, it's my vote it's my way of saying I want this product that's got the fair trade on so uh, I think the, the the more that we can keep our eyes open um, where it's something like chocolate um, just only buy it um, if it's got fair trade where we see other things that are rarely fair trade then by buying it we're giving that market signal so that we can all do what we can I like the idea of the market signal or the kind of consumer vote and, and um, that sort of leads on to a question that I have for, for, for Nabila um, uh, from uh, our group member Jeremy uh, who's, who's asked um, which sectors are implicated in, uh, in Uyghur forced labour supply chains and then you know, as, a, as a direct result of that then, then we might be able to, to bring about some of the kind of consumer campaigning that um, fair trade has done so successfully. So, um, would you like me to put up the screen um, of all the companies just again? Yeah, so I think that's a really good idea. I mean, what we what we can do, and and I think um, from the response that we've had from some of the questions, I think people would be really keen to 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 look at um, and and maybe study some of the, these um, in a bit more detail, Nabila. So we can share this uh, when we send around it? the email. Yes. Okay. Perfect. So, um, yeah. So. Obviously, as you can see from um, the list of companies, it's very diverse, but textile manufacturers in, in particular have received a lot of media attention and a lot of um, coverage. Um, I don't know, um, a couple of months ago on Twitter, a video was actually released 
of Chinese officials going into Xinjiang and um, trying to persuade, let's say, um, the, the, you know, the just graduated from high school Uyghur girls to work in textile factories in eastern China. Um, so I, from what I've uh, gathered, um, Uyghurs are quite skilled in textile manufacturing anyway, it's something that they've got a speciality in. Um, so that makes it quite attractive for textile uh, firms to set up shop there or for Uyghurs to be um, exported to eastern China to work in textile factories there. So textile manufacturer is, partic is particularly uh, prolific. If you want to talk about a specific company, Zara is uh, quite belligerent when it comes to the use of Uyghur labour. So that could be a potential brand that we could target. Uh, we could do a, a potential campaign or a target around um, in terms of textile manufacturing. I hope that answers the question. Uh, yes, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm sure it did. And um, uh, it sort of, uh, it really, it really strikes me that some of these campaigns, um, sorry, some of these uh, retailers, particularly at the younger end of the market, like Zara and, and um, so social media would be really, um, could be something that, that, that could be quite effective. Um, Instagram and, and Twitter and, um, and, and other kind of uh, ways of, of raising awareness about the practices of some of these organisations. Um, can I can I also ask Nabila? Um, we have a question from Tony here. Um, how much information do we have about the extent to which China is requiring human rights reductions in the BRI countries? So, um, do we have much actually much information about 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 how these things are changing, other than what's coming out about the Uyghurs? I wouldn't be able to I wouldn't be able to answer that because the BRI is so huge, so I wouldn't have the exact figures. Um, I think generally across the globe, human rights violations are getting bigger and bolder. And that's not necessarily just to do with China. I just think it's got to do with the rise of authoritarianism. So if you look like in the UK, the US, the human rights violations have increased quite dramatically. Um, and I think it's also got to do with the rise of authoritarian strongmen government. So leaders like Xi Jinping, Netanyahu, um, uh, Vladimir Putin, even Donald Trump. So um, human rights, we're just going through a phase uh, or a period of just human rights violations ge generally. Um, in terms of BRI country, there is, um, there is evidence to suggest it is increasing. So I'll give you an example. Um, China is investing a lot of money into developing the Balkans, the Balkan regions in um, Europe. And um, one of the places is in Belgrade. So I think there are plans or they have already installed thousands of security cameras in Belgrade because they're trying to link up uh, Belgrade with Korea's port in Greece. Um, that's in my like longer presentation about the BRI, but basically um, Korea's port in Greece has been bought by the Chinese um, and it's a really successful port for them. And it's a way they want to, it to basically compete with the port of Valencia in Spain, which is very like, the biggest port in Europe. Um, so they see uh, Bel Belgrade as a link towards that port. Um, there's also been issues in Pakistan. Um, so I think there was an incident about a month ago where um, the Pakistani parliament discovered uh, spy cameras in the parliament and that caused quite a big commotion. Um, I think in Karachi as well, they've also been in installing CCTV cameras. Um, but I just want to point out that this is something that we do in the West as well. So London has so many sp um, spy cameras and hidden CCTV and things. And I think the Met Police were trying to install facial recognition uh, software to spy on protesters. There's also an issue with phones. You cannot take your battery out of a phone anymore. They're all inbuilt, which um, I think it makes it difficult. Uh, basically, if you don't take the battery out of your phone, you can still be tracked, like GPS and things. Um, and I think that's something that protesters uh, affect protesters quite a lot. So this is a global issue. It's not just China. This is happening all over the world, and Western companies are very, very much implicated in this. Sure. I mean, there was a time when the UK was the, the most surveilled country in the world. I, I understand, but um, yeah. I suspect that that's not the case anymore. Um, <laughs> Um, I have a couple of questions here for, um, for Nada. Um, firstly, Nada, um, should we be concerned about um, all the investments um, uh, by Western um, companies in Israel or only those listed in the database? 
Well, for companies working and involved in the settlements, it is an issue because, uh, as you know, and as was mentioned by the report of um, the commission, which the fact-finding mission, which uh, studied the issue, they showed that businesses are going to help maintain this uh, illegal settlement expansion by their work. So if companies uh, fulfill their due diligence and are looking into uh, working or being involved in, uh, Israel settle in Israeli settlements, then they should see that they will be contributing to human rights violations and as such should not be involved uh, in Israeli settlements. Thank you. Um, and I also have a question for you from, from Pam Parsons. Um, what role would you like to see Amnesty take in relation to raising awareness about the UN list of companies profiting from the occupation of Palestine? Um, could Amnesty also do anything to try to ensure that the list is regularly updated? Yes, uh, Amnesty is doing a lot of work uh, in coordination with Al Haq, which is a Palestinian organization working on the issue of business and human rights, as well as the organization I work with, which is Cairo Institute for Human Rights Studies. But Amnesty, Human Rights Watch, and others are doing a lot of important work. I think what is also needed is for people to write to these companies listed in the database. And this is important as it shows that their reputation is on the line. The fact that they are involved in these um, in settlements which constitute a war crime is important for the awareness. But uh, in terms of the UK also has responsibilities when it has companies uh, listed in their jurisdiction working in these settlements. So I think so the general civil society work uh, on these levels are very important, targeting uh, the, uh, the companies and targeting the UK. But I'm afraid the UK has uh, not very progressive positions on the UN database uh, in the Human Rights Council. And uh, most of the countries um, yeah, that are listed have been reluctant uh, to have this, uh, this database published. However, as we have said, it's not a, in any way uh, a list that calls for sanctions, for example. This is just to raise awareness and to raise transparency around, about companies' involvement. And it is a very important tool in the sense that there is no binding uh, treaty until today uh, regarding the issue of transnational corporate corporations' involvement in uh, situations of war or of conflict or of occupation. So this is an important tool of transparency that we say to, we call on all states to support uh, as they are uh, speaking against Israeli settlements that constitute a war crime. The UK is saying that uh, Israeli settlements constitute a war crime. So now there should be further another step in this direction where not only these are in declarations, but in the facts, like not helping maintain through businesses this illegal, the illegal settlements. Thank you. Uh, Peter, I have a question, another question for you. Um, which method of campaigning would you say is the most effective, insider or outsider? And also, where do you think the vested interests lie in the food global supply chain? Um, I, I, I don't think we can say one or the other. It's the combination that makes the difference. I know that sounds like a cop out, but it, it really is. Um, and uh, so Oxfam finds that um, on any campaign, um, you need to sort of talk to the people with the power, but get the public on side as, as well. You, 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 need, you need both in any uh, cam campaign. But can you remind me of the second bit of the question? Um, yes, it was the, the who has the vested interest in the global um, global food supply supply chain. Um, That's a tough question. This is a right, pretty right. tough question. Yeah, yeah. I, I can I can see that there's that there must be a huge dilemma 
um, for particularly at those supermarkets because um, I buy which magazine every month it says which supermarket is the cheapest so there's that pressure on from the public saying you know why why aren't you the the cheapest and comparing prices and and and, and so on um, and so there's that interest there in keeping the prices down which inevitably affects the suppliers and the people that we care about but that's why it's so important to uh, say to the supermarkets yes you know we do care what we pay but we're prepared to pay a few pence more so that those people who grow the food have a living wage and decent conditions and that we are prepared to pay more because that extra five or ten pence doesn't mean, mean much to us but it means such a lot of difference to the people who grow the food and, and process the food absolutely it's all about some you, you you said it right at the very beginning um uh, was about the inequality um in, and the the, the the gap um between us and, and the people who are actually picking and growing a lot of this food. Um, I have another question for Nabila. Um, I'll start to wind up because I'm conscious that um, that you've, you've all been, all three of you have been talking for quite some time now. Um, uh, but um, Nabila, um, we uh, have a question here. What, what methods uh, would you use in order to pressurise um, China and to eliminate current and prevent further human rights abuses? Um, as as it is, expands across um, the China-Pakistan and Kazakhstan borders, um, you did mention early on um, um, Atajurt as as a, as a potential kind of leverage. Um, uh, but w w can can you identify any other um, any other methods that, that that you think might be might be appropriate? I think community organising in the Pakistani community here would be very important. So the UK has a very large Pakistani population and it's very powerful. We've got lots of uh, people in parliament, metro mayors, whatever, like, you know, lots of prominent people. And I think if we could um, use the power of the Pakistani community to pressure the government back home to then speak out against Chinese human rights abuses and not tolerate it, I think that would be quite powerful. I also think consumer pressure. So if factories start um, feeling the pinch in terms of what the customers want and start relocating out of Xinjiang and maybe relocating out of China entirely um, that would um, you know that would make an enormous impact because money talks let's, let's, let's be real money is everything that makes everything go around and if you hit China in the pocket it will damage them quite badly as well as uh, reputational damage so these are my ideas if anyone has any more please let me know I'm always uh, keen to listen to new ideas Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, the, 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 your story about Disney, for example, I mean, you know, Disney is, is you know, it's just a stride, the stride to the globe, really. And, mm. um, and um, it was interesting, I think it was more of a comment than, than, than a question that um, about the list of um, companies that went up and was BMW there? And um, one of the perhaps yeah, well, somebody's I mentioned the BMW and the fact that we have a big BMW um, a uh, factory here in 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 Oxford, and mm. um, uh, you know that there 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 are possibilities for 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 perhaps linking into something there in terms of um, of consumer pressure. Um, and I'm really struck as well by your comments about engaging with the Pakistani community in the UK. And I think you know um, there there's there's a role for. Um, Amnesty in terms of we 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 introduced tonight's talk with 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 hopefully this this um uh this this festival that we're part of tonight uh, uh, engaging with a more with a wider audience and um it would be great if we could engage with a more diverse audience and um and and certainly link up say with 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 the Pakistani community to 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 achieve some of these goals um, amongst others um, I have a final question for Nada on um, uh, Palestine and then um, I have one just final question for just a, a few words for for everybody um, it's quite a long one and I apologize for leaving this one till last it came in quite late um, so if the UN the so-called upholder of the human rights um, of human rights is passively endorsing the occupation um, uh, sorry apologies I have to um, 
scroll down to see these questions, um, um, is, is, is passively endorsing the, the occupation um, as a result of international political pressure from countries that direct, so, sorry, um, and that's as a result of um, international political pressure. Um, with this in mind, where can supporters of Palestine direct their support and donations and continue to oppose the Israeli settler colonial regime? And I don't think that we can say that the UN is endorsing the um, Israel's colonial regime or uh, or settlements, but definitely the issue here is uh, that Israel has not been held accountable for any of the violations, while uh, countless reports uh, by fact-finding missions and commissions of inquiry at the Human Rights Council have found that it has co it had committed crimes, war crimes, and crimes against humanity possibly crimes against humanity in the in its uh, prolonged occupation um but now what is very i think important and uh what a recent report by human rights watch about israeli apartheid has been um uh the last report by human rights organizations um the latest report by human rights organization on the issue uh, as Palestinian human rights organizations, as well as regional and international, are recognizing that Israel has established an apartheid regime over the Palestinian people as a whole, whether they live in the OPT in 48, and what the attacks on Palestinians demonstrating today in uh, the what uh, is Israel proper um, and Palestinian citizens living in Israel and the attacks they have been facing by uh, by uh, Israeli police as well as by Israeli right-wing um, people who have been there was mob violence there were attacks that what we're seeing on uh, the on the news today shows that this is not only in the OPT this is also this is an institutionalized regime of racial domination and oppression and recognizing this reality i think is very important and mobilizing against apartheid is really something that everyone can do in order to support the palestinian people dismantle this apartheid regime and also uh call on all um, actors to put an end to this to this regime. I think this is one of the main uh, calls of our apartheid campaign on this specifically. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, I have just one final question for, for, for everybody. Um, inevitably, the Brexit, the B word has, has come up and uh, somebody asked a question, well, Penny Halliday asked a question about um, uh, the um, Brexit affecting the um, UK's desire to increase trade with China. Um, so um, I, I'll, I'll put that question to, to Nabila, but um, if, and if, if and either of the other speakers um, wants to say anything about the impact of Brexit, um, you don't have to, but I just thought I'd offer that chance because it's been, um, and beside COVID, which we could have had a whole, we could have had a whole, whole evening talking about COVID. Um, uh, Brexit's the next big thing. So Nabila, um, in terms of it impacting the UK's desire to, to increase trade with, with China. I mean, I definitely think that's a factor. I believe the UK is actually already a BRI country. So um, the BRI is already in the UK and it's in several European countries. And I think there was a joke made that, the you know, the limit of the BRI is California. So they definitely have their sights set on, you know, reshaping global trade routes to benefit China. Um, I mean, I think this government doesn't need any more excuses to not violate people's human rights. I mean, they're, they're doing pretty well themselves anyway. Um, so I think the composition of the government that we have, they'll, they'll prioritize trade with China over human rights defending because they don't care. Um, I think there was actually a, an, an amendment, a genocide amendment to a trade bill that the House of Lords passed and the UK government actually blocked. I'm not um, a law expert or anything, but I believe that is what happened. Um, so I think, you know, the, the UK government is very much concerned with economic growth, with development, especially with, with Brexit, because they're mm -hmm. just basically desperate for trade deals. Um, so I think, you know, Parliament isn't the be all and end all. And as activists, we've got to make sure that we can hold our government to account over issues such as this. And maybe if they put another amendment forward, 
pressure the government to actually um, follow through because I think the amendment was actually to stop or like limit um, trade with countries that have been proven to engage in genocide. I'm not saying that's what's happened here because it, it you know there's no proof that or the legal definition hasn't been met but there was an amendment for that. Sure okay thank you. Um, Peter any thoughts on Brexit and how that might impact on your campaigning? Yes yes um, I, I must make absolutely clear that I'm not a Brexiteer. I voted to remain. <laughs> There's another referendum that I still vote to. For your safety, you're, you're amongst friends either way here. But you know, we 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 wouldn't but, wouldn't but, budge either way, Peter. Um, but Brexit does give some opportunities because it means that we move away from the agricultural subsidies of the European Union, which can be very unfair to the poorest countries. Com in the world who want to um, either export to the EU or who are, um, have subsidised food that's been produced in the EU dumped on them. So we've moved away from that. We can set our own tariffs so we don't have to have high tariffs for, on food from the developing world. And so it's incumbent on us to give that signal to the government that we care about everybody around the world. Um, the big issue is the massive cuts in uh, international aid, but in opposing those cuts, we're also giving that signal that we care about those people in the poorest parts of the world and that under Brexit, we have an op opportunity to at least do no harm to those countries that want to um, export their food to us. Whereas under the EU, massive amounts of harm with tariff bar barriers and unfair subsidies. So at least we've, we've got the potential to move away from that. It's really, that's fascinating actually. Yeah, but the, of course there's completely different and you know, different lens through which to, to view it. Thank you. Nada, did you have any any comments around um, how Brexit might impact on on your campaigning? I think you may have frozen. Are you still with us? Okay, what I'll do um, is I'll just um, there was just one one last um, sort of comment on the questions then um, I'll do a, a wrap up and if, if Nada comes back in, then um, she'll be able to uh, just to say a last couple of words. Just um, there, was, there was a final question that um, uh, whether uh, we us speakers and, and um, those of us involved in this evening um, have social media sites. Um, and um, just as a response to, to that question, um, we will, when we send out the follow up to this 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 um this event we'll email everybody that's take that's that's been um an attendee tonight and we'll send out a, a contact for um uh, all of the speakers um according to, to to whatever whatever you're happy with um Pisa, Nada, Nabila and um you have your social media or any other uh, campaign materials that that you'd like us to to distribute to our to our attendees so thank you um, not as having connection issues, so um, I, anybody who wants to follow up with any questions with Nada, um, there'll be a, a, a way to, to contact her organisation uh, that comes out in the, the email we send out to everybody. So um, I'm just going to finish now, um, of course, thanking our speakers. Um, and um, just uh, I wanted to, to, to give a final few words on the, the, the festival that we're, that we're part of. So um, just to say, uh, I really hope you enjoyed this evening and please do check out the full programme of events and activities um, in the festival. And um, if after tonight's discussion, you're interested more in, in um, the role that companies can play in human rights, then um, there is a further talk as part of the festival um, it's um, uh, on responsibility and liability that UK companies bear for their human rights impacts at home and abroad. Uh, it's on Wednesday the 26th of May and it's presented by the Daventry and Rugby Amnesty International group. Um, features Peter Frankenthal of Amnesty International. He's the um, UK Economic Relations Programme Director and Jennifer Zirk, who's the international human rights lawyer, sorry, a hum international human rights lawyer. 
Um, you can find that event and all the other events on the festival website. You just need to Google um, Amnesty Festival of Social Justice and there's a full listing there of everything that's yet to come with um, uh, organised by date and registration details and um, uh, the festival runs until the 31st of May, the end of this month. Um, there's also a link there to the festival YouTube website um, and um, there's uh, on there there's event recordings like um, from, from this evening, um, along with a rich selection of pre-recorded content, uh, short individual video selfies, which are part of our social justice soapbox. And if you're interested in doing that, um, you can uh, record a short video and explain in a nutshell what social justice means to you. Um, the festival has been an important initiative um, and we're hoping that it will help make the amnesty movement within our region, within the central region, um, bigger and better connected, more diverse and more influential. And for example, you know, the discussion, that, the short discussion that Nabila and I had around um, including different communities. Um, uh, obviously, Amnesty works with all different sorts of communities anyway, but I'm um, always open to, um, to, to, to increasing our diversity. And um, the, this festival has represented a significant new departure for Amnesty and, um, in the region, and we're intending to build on it after the festival finishes. So um, my final thanks to our speakers. You've been absolutely great. And um, having worked with you all now for, for um, a couple of months, we've been planning this at least, haven't we? And it's been a, just a complete pleasure working with you. And thank you so much for your talks. Um, hopefully we'll, we will be in touch with one another. Um, thanks to everybody who's helped to make this such a great event. And um, thanks to everybody who's participated, who's been in the audience. And um, just to say good night to everybody and uh, stay safe. Good night. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye.